going on? In Miami, a 140-ton cargo plane pitches up suddenly on takeoff. Who knows how much weight was on the airplane might have affected the pitch control of this aircraft. When a packed commuter flight crashes, it reveals that passengers are at risk every day. It was sitting low when it taxied out. It looked heavy. Baggage, people said that it was hard to shut the door because they thought bags were going to come out. And a jumbo jet heavily loaded with armored vehicles. Get the nose down! Trying! Mysteriously falls from the sky. Holy crap, one of those things actually moved. If that cargo shifts, you'll wind up with a potential pitch problem. Three planes with perilous payloads force investigators to question every calculation. We know what to do. We just don't do it. August the 7th, 1997. Fine Air Cargo Flight 101 prepares for a flight from Miami, Florida to the Dominican Republic. Fine Air 101, clear to Santa Domingo. Where are you parked? Captain Patrick Thompson is a former Marine and highly experienced pilot specializing in cargo flights. Okay, 1407 on the squawk and we're up in the northeast corner, thanks. First Officer Steve Petrosky will be the pilot flying during this leg. All good out there. OK, thank you. Flight engineer Glenn Millington just finished his walk around. He still needs to check the cargo. They still got the belly open? Yeah, I'll go back and check out what's going on. Fine Air is the largest cargo airline flying into and out of Miami, a hub that's rapidly expanding. Miami-Dade, and literally all the South Florida area, the 90s was a heyday. There was this big economic boom from trade with Latin America. Today's route to Santo Domingo is a two hour and 10 minute flight southeast over the Atlantic. In the cargo hold, Millington checks to see if the pallets holding the cargo are secure. Looks like we're good to go. The DC-8 is loaded with more than 87,000 pounds of denim. Howdy. Cargo so valuable, it requires a security escort. At 12.30 p.m., Flight 101 taxis to its runway. Fine Air 101, fly heading 270, cleared for takeoff. Clear takeoff 27 right. Fine Air 101 heavy. Four spooled and stable. Max power. Okay, coming up on 60 knots, power set. 80. The takeoff is going smoothly. V1, rotate. Easy, easy, easy. Suddenly, the nose pitches up. Something is wrong. The air traffic controller is alarmed by what he now sees. What's going on? Whoa, whoa. The crew fights to get the plane under control. But they can't. Too low, terrain. What's happening? No! Where's your emergency? Yes, sir. There's been a plane crash at 72nd and 25th. You need to roll everything because it's right down across the street. It's the unthinkable. A plane crash in the heart of Miami. Hundreds of people have witnessed the catastrophe. 
I saw the plane coming directly at me. When it crossed one of the freeways, by chance, the traffic lights were red. And so it managed to cross the freeway with not a huge amount of loss of life. The plane's three-man crew and an onboard security guard are confirmed dead. And one victim on the ground is killed in his parked car. The National Transportation Safety Board in Washington rushes their GO team to Miami. Former Air Force pilot Bob Benzen is the lead investigator. More than 48,000 pounds of jet fuel turned the plane into a mass of smoking debris. There weren't a lot of large parts left. The engines were recognizable, pieces of the tail perhaps, but the rest of it was a burned up mess. Bob Benzen is eager to get data from the plane's black box recorders. I got them both. Good work. They're sent to Washington for analysis. As investigators wait for the flight data, a witness account from the plane's air traffic controller gives them immediate insight. Just after takeoff, he, he went steeply nose up. I could see the tops of the wings. What this told us early in the investigation was that we either had a problem with the airplane, something that the pilots did during the takeoff, or there may have been something wrong with the load. They were definitely spinning. Benzen and his team quickly rule out a mechanical problem with the plane's engines. We looked inside them, and it looked like they were all operating at high power settings, just from visual examination. They begin scouring the scorched cargo hold in search of answers. Got something. Picking through layers of torch debris, Benzen makes a shocking discovery. His bear claws unlocked. Bear claws physically clamp pallets to the cargo hold. We found a lot of these bear claws or cargo locks uh, open. So they wouldn't have been restraining cargo. Every pallet in the hold is supposed to be locked before takeoff to prevent cargo from shifting. But at the crash scene, investigators find even more bear claws that are open. We found 60 bear claws and like 57 or so were actually open. And that, that was not a good thing. It's a disturbing discovery, indicating the possibility that cargo shifted on takeoff. Hey, easy, easy, easy. A plane's cargo must be carefully positioned to keep its front and rear balanced. The balancing point is called the center of gravity. The center of gravity of an airplane is a theoretical point at which the airplane balances. If you could hold up the airplane by your finger, it would be the one place that it would be totally balanced. If the center of gravity shifts mid-flight, then the plane becomes unstable and might be impossible to fly. It's very important that the center of gravity stays within its specified range. If you have too many pallets shifting in the rear of the airplane, it's going to be too tail heavy. If they're in the forward part of the airplane, it'll be too nose heavy. If the cargo on flight 101 shifted during takeoff, rotate, the change in the plane's center of gravity could have been catastrophic. Easy, easy, easy. The airplane may pitch up very rapidly, and they would have to react very quickly so that it doesn't pitch up into a stall condition. What's going on? Whoa. And that's exactly what the air traffic controller reported seeing. Just four days after Flight 101 came down, investigators are now confident that shifting cargo caused the crash. Now all they have to do oh, no. is no. prove it. Investigators need to confirm if the cargo on board Fine Air Flight 101 wasn't properly secured, shifting the center of gravity of the aircraft. Hey, easy, easy. That led us to start talking to the folks that uh, actually loaded the cargo. Benzen discovers that Fine Air had a partnership with a Dominican freight company. 
Aramar. There's no doubt most of them were left unlocked. Investigators expect the supervisor to admit fault. But it's almost the opposite. We only logged the first and last pallets. The supervisor shows investigators another DC-8, which is being loaded with 18 pallets. Each pallet is wheeled into place along a rail built into the floor. All of the spaces in the hold get filled with either empty or loaded pallets. If the pallets at the front and the back of the plane are locked, the cargo can't shift. Records show that all 18 positions on Flight 101 were filled with either full or empty pallets. I can't see how it would have shifted. We knew that there wasn't enough space for the cargo to have shifted. The tidy theory of cargo shifting is shot down. The investigation needs a new angle. If the cargo was secure, Benzen and his team wonder if the pilots misconfigured the plane according to its load. Let's get started. That could have caused the plane to pitch up and suddenly go out of control. Before takeoff, pilots pre-select the pitch of the plane by adjusting the rear horizontal stabilizer. The angle of the stabilizer is determined according to the plane's weight and balance. All good out there. OK, thank you. Now in possession of the black box data, investigators listen to the cockpit voice recording. 2.4 indicated. They confirm the pilots had configured the jet according to the reported load. So why the extreme pitch up? Again, investigators are stumped. If the stabilizer setting was configured according to its weight and balance, max power, investigators need to develop a new theory. Was the plane too heavy to fly? We were focusing on how much weight was on the airplane as it might have affected the pitch control of this aircraft. Benzen and his team compare the cargo weight against the manufacturer's maximum weight specifications. The plane was 32,000 pounds underweight. It's a dead end. The plane wasn't overweight. But Benzen knows something isn't adding up. A lot of little things built up to have us believe that uh, Fine Airlines wasn't living up to its name. Desperate to find a new clue, Benzen's team reviews all of their evidence, including security footage of the plane loading. Everything seems to be routine until Benzen is struck by the sight of cargo coming off the plane. Take a look. Any idea what's going on? Me neither. Adding to the mystery, the Aeromar and Fine Air supervisors are in a heated discussion. Something was amiss. We didn't know what, but something was going on. Benzen needs to find out what. So they pay another visit to the loading teams. Why did you remove those pallets at the last minute? The pallets didn't fit. Investigators now learn that two of the pallets couldn't fit their assigned space because their pre-wrapped cargo spilled over the side. They don't fit. The fine air supervisor is asked how he fixed the problem, and his solution shocks investigators. Get these ones out so you can push those ones back. They moved several loaded pallets back into the spaces designated for empty pallets. So all the pallets were just moved back? Yes, sir. But what's even more troubling is that no one thought to tell the flight crew that the center of gravity had shifted to the back. Looks like we're good to go. To investigators, it looks like the plane's center of gravity was now dangerously wrong. They zero in on a new theory. You can move cargo around as much as you want, but the flight crew needs to know what the final configuration is. Knowing the configuration, 2.4 indicated, allows the pilots to properly set their rear stabilizer for takeoff. They just weren't thinking. 
Now investigators must prove whether the careless act caused the accident. They review the plane's actual weight distribution. 13 moves to 14. That's an extra 5,854 pounds to the back. This shift of heavy pallets to the rear became a rather big deal because it ended up putting the center of gravity very, very far to the rear, probably past the safe point. Investigators head to a flight simulator to do flight tests with the actual cargo arrangement on flight 101. OK, good to go. The conditions at takeoff are recreated as accurately as possible. Too low, terrain. In the end, we were able to determine that the uh, actual center of gravity for the accident airplane was just beyond safe limit. Oh, oh. That's what allowed the airplane to pitch up so aggressively just after takeoff. They didn't stand a chance. Had the pilots known of the change in balance to the load, 2.4 indicated, they could have adjusted their stabilizer setting appropriately prior to takeoff. Set for departure. Instead, Flight 101 hey, easy. is configured for disaster. What's going on? Oh, oh. Whoa! Whoa! No! The NTSB's conclusions are a wake-up call for the cargo industry in southern Florida. Fine Air is ordered to overhaul their supervision of the cargo loading process. Weight and balance are so fundamental to flight that the lessons learned from the Fine Air crash should last throughout the industry. But they don't. It's stunning that they keep happening because that's no mystery. That one has been solved. We know what to do. We just don't do it. In North Carolina, just six and a half years later, an out-of-balance commuter plane crashes. And investigators uncover how another perilous payload takes the lives of everyone on board. January the 8th, 2003, Charlotte Douglas International Airport. Captain Katie Leslie is at work early. Only 25 years old, this Texas native is one of the youngest flight captains at her airline. Attention, ladies and gentlemen, this is the final boarding call. Air Midwest runs a bustling commuter service out of the airport. Today, Captain Leslie commands a Beechcraft 1900D on a 30-minute hop to Greenville Spartanburg Airport in Greer, North Carolina. At 8 in the morning, 19 passengers board the flight. Meanwhile, as part of the standard checklist before takeoff, the crew calculates the weight of all the baggage, passengers, and fuel on the plane. So we got a full house back there? Yeah, you can count 19 people in the back. Cool. 17, 0, 18. 17, 120 is our weight, huh? Yeah, is our max. So we're cool. So, yeah. Good morning. Welcome aboard US Airways Express Service to Greenville, Spartanburg. It's a very short flight, and we'll have you there in a few minutes. Ready for departure, the pilots taxi out to the runway. Air Midwest 5481, turn right, heading 230. Cleared for takeoff. Set takeoff power, please. 80 knots. Cross check. To air traffic control, flight 5481's takeoff roll is perfectly normal. Gear up. What? No. Oh. Without warning, the plane's nose pitches dramatically upward. Push the nose down! Oh my god! We have an emergency on air Midwest 
the plane stalls, rolls to the left, and begins falling from the sky. Captain Leslie tries to get the plane to climb, but it's too late. The plane dives towards a US Airways hangar with hundreds of people working inside. It's a total loss. All 21 people on board, including the flight crew, are dead. Remarkably, only one person on the ground is injured in the disaster. It falls on NTSB lead investigator Lorenda Ward to figure out what happened to the plane. Due to the post-crash fire, when you initially walked up to it, it was hard to identify that you had an airplane that could hold 21 people. Within hours of the crash, investigators find the black boxes from the charred remains of Air Midwest Flight 5481. While they wait for the black box data to be downloaded, they begin interviewing ground workers at the airport. And did you notice anything unusual before takeoff? Well, it was sitting low when it taxied out. It looked heavy. We had a couple of witnesses that were implying that we had a very heavily loaded airplane. Every plane has a maximum weight it can handle before the engines can't get it off the ground. Before takeoff, it's the pilot's job to calculate the onboard weight. So we got a full house back there? You can count 19 people in the back. When investigators review the cockpit voice recorder, they get confirmation that the crew of Flight 5481... Cool. 17 ...did perform that calculation. So, we're cool. So, yeah. On any plane, large or small, the weight of cargo and passengers has to be distributed evenly, and pilots work closely with the loading team to monitor the weight and balance of the cargo. I don't think we're going to have to take anything off. Air Midwest pilots are trained to make weight calculations using average weights. 175 pounds per passenger and 20 pounds per bag. Due to using the average weights and average calculations, uh, the paperwork showed them being within the range that they needed to take off. Three, two, But Ward needs to know if the plane really was within the proper range of weight and balance. What we did is we looked at the weights of the actual baggage itself and then the weight of the passengers and the crew. Yes, could you tell me, please, what the last recorded weight of your patient is, please? Ward learns that most passengers are now heavier than the average weight that's guided pilots for decades. And when all the numbers are in... 212. Ward discovers the real weight of Flight 5481 is 17,700 pounds some 580 pounds over its maximum takeoff weight. Right. They would not have been able to take off if they had used actual weights. They would have had to pull either passengers or bags off. The excess weight meant the plane was tail heavy and its center of gravity was too far to the rear. Gear up. The discovery explains the plane's sudden pitch upwards. But flight data reveals the pitch was at an angle from which the pilots should have been able to recover. For Lorenda Ward, something doesn't stack up. She needs to know what other factors contributed to the catastrophic crash. Investigators need to understand why the pilots of US Airways Flight 5481 didn't regain control when their plane pitched violently upwards. Sifting through the crash site wreckage, they make a critical discovery. The shredded remains of the plane's elevator control cables, vital to flight control. They looked unusual. They, they weren't in like the normal position that you would find them. In this case, we had one adjusted all the way out and then one adjusted all the way in. The state of the elevator cables is alarming. 
These cables link the pilot's control columns to the flight elevator, an aerodynamic panel that helps pilots climb and descend. Ward now believes that the pilot's ability to control the plane's pitch could have been severely compromised. But she doesn't know why. Puzzled, investigators dig into the plane's maintenance history and interview the aircraft mechanics. What they find strikes at the very heart of what went wrong. Once you have the rig pin set, adjust the turnbuckle barrels for more tension in the cable. Yeah. In the days before the crash, during maintenance of the plane's elevator cables, got it. mechanics in training skipped some vital steps. What about the other steps? Yeah, uh, don't worry about those. Skipping critical steps. Oh, help me! Put the elevator cables out of alignment. Oh, my God. And crippled the pilot's efforts to adjust the plane's pitch. They lost the ability to control the aircraft. Oh, my God! They had no elevator movement enough to bring the nose back down. Push the nose down! Oh, my God! We have an emergency on Air Midwest. Alert 3, stand by. Runway 18, right. In her report, Ward concludes that before takeoff, Flight 5481 was 580 pounds overweight and slightly tail heavy. Then, careless maintenance meant pilots did not have sufficient control of the elevators to fight the problem. Loaded with a perilous payload, the plane was doomed the moment it left the ground. They didn't know that they had these two hidden latent failures that were waiting for them. The NTSB states the need for more thorough and supervised maintenance of small aircraft. Ward's investigation also makes the stunning revelation that average weight calculations put passengers at risk. She recommends the Federal Aviation Authority review how the weight of people and their baggage is calculated. When you see a weight and balance accident, it's a failure of the system. We have the knowledge to safely load airplanes. It's an accident type we've seen before, and those are the worst type for an investigator. Bagram Airfield in northeastern Afghanistan the U.S. military base is a hive of activity, with troops, weapons, and heavy machinery constantly on the move. Bagram, ground, ISF. 9-5, Alpha Quebec, ready to taxi. The crew of National Airlines Flight 102 is flying cargo in a converted Boeing 747. The air is just billowing out of here. Yeah, sure is. They're on the last leg of a grueling shift. After flying from Chateau Roux, France, to Camp Bastion, where they loaded 207,000 pounds of cargo, it was a quick hop to Bagram. Once the plane is refueled, they'll fly two and a half hours to Dubai. Captain Brad Hassler is heading home to his pregnant wife. Beside him is First Officer Jamie Brokaw. Augment Captain Jeremy Lipka is in the jump seat. The sheet's back there. I haven't seen him. I hope he's in the back. Yeah, he's back there. In a cabin behind the cockpit is loadmaster Michael Sheets, along with three other crew members. The loadmaster is double checking that the flight cargo is properly stowed and ready for the flight. At 3.25 p.m., the flight crew are cleared for takeoff. 95 out for Quebec, runway three, full length. Prepare for departure. At that same moment, military journalist Stephen Hartoff is returning to the base from a day's work taking photographs for a magazine. I saw off to the left of the truck a white and purple 747. And I remember thinking this is a beautiful airplane because it looked brand new. V1. Rotate. Positive climb. What's going on with that aircraft? It was almost stuttering in the air. And I immediately said to Chris, what's going on with that aircraft? Is he taking fire? 
Keep on that. The plane is suddenly uncontrollable. Get the nose down! I'm trying! The nose won't drop. My airplane! If they can't get the nose down fast, the plane will stall. For a moment, they hang in the air, suspended. And then the aircraft seem to sort of careen in our direction. Stop the car. Now you're looking at a big 747 coming at you. A 747 cargo plane falls from Afghan skies. And in a very slow motion, it just went straight down and pancaked into the ground. It was a mushroom cloud, like a small atom bomb. It was huge. The entire base thundered under our feet. National Airlines Flight 102 is obliterated. It's the worst aviation accident ever at Bagram Airfield. Remarkably, no one on the ground is hit, but the entire flight crew is dead. Uh, watching those people die was tough. It's tough. Amid the specter of a terrorist attack, the NTSB is assigned to lead the investigation. This investigation was a lot different because uh, we were flying into a war zone. When we first got there, we were given bulletproof vests and Kevlar helmets to wear into the accident site. So what do you got for me? The NTSB will have to work closely with the military. A sweep of the crash site has already turned up the black boxes. But there's not much else for investigators to work with. Except for the tail section, much of the plane has been consumed by the inferno. Soon after the team starts sifting through the wreckage, a video of the accident appears on the internet. Holy cow. There it is. It reveals a huge clue about the plane's erratic climb and fall. Looks like a problem with the cargo load. The aircraft's movement in the video suggests the flight may have been out of balance. Some of the early questions were, you know, what was the cargo in the airplane? How heavy was the cargo? By examining the cargo manifest, investigators discover that the plane was carrying an unusual load. Five armored vehicles called MRAPs, or mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicles. These massive, heavily armed cars each weigh between 12 and 18 tons. Each vehicle was chained to a custom-built pallet and secured with straps to the plane's main deck by the loading crew. The cargo in this particular case was very heavy. It was the first time they'd ever flown five vehicles this heavy. Investigators calculate the precise weight carried on board. Max takeoff weight is 870,000 pounds. We have 207,000 pounds of cargo plus fuel. They learn that with the heavy cargo and fuel load, the plane was not overweight. Weight was definitely not an issue. But it's not just the onboard weight that investigators need to analyze. The balance of the load could be the problem. Bring up the schematics. We fill it with our cargo. After a few calculations, the investigators have their answer. The airplane actually could carry the weight, and as loaded, was within the center of gravity. It's a dead end. Investigators explore another angle. Even if the load was balanced before takeoff, it could have shifted as the plane left the ground. The focus now turns to the loading procedures. Specifically, were the MRAPs properly secured by the loadmaster and his crew? I flew transports for the US Air Force for many, many years, 23 years in the Lockheed C-141. We were totally dependent on our loadmasters to get it right. They are the ones who could kill us or not if they put the load in the wrong position. 
Investigators study the manual the loadmaster used to calculate how many heavy nylon straps are needed to secure the vehicles. And seeing his rationale for calculating um, those numbers all seemed to make sense to me. But it adds yet more mystery to the investigation. If the plane was underweight, with the cargo secured and balanced in line with company standards, what else could possibly have caused the crash? Desperate for a new theory, the investigators hope the data retrieved from the 747's black boxes will shed some light on the horrific crash. Flight data recorders record what the elevator and the ailerons and what the control pitches are doing. You have the readouts? And so we were very hopeful that we would get good information from those recorders that would help explain why the airplane had crashed. Thank you. But the team is hit with another problem. The cockpit voice recorder stopped recording mere seconds after takeoff. Bring up the CVR. Stand by. Fortunately, it was recording during the crew's hour-long wait on the tarmac. There's your trouble, Brad. What is it? Sounds like the first officer is showing something to the captain. One of the damn straps is busted. Pause there. The CVR suggests the first officer found a broken strap inside the cargo hold. Did the trap move? Yeah, just tighten up on the straps. Holy crap, one of those things actually moved? So from that information, we know that they had a load shift when they came in and landed, and that was very important to us in our investigation. Investigators now wonder whether the loadmaster properly tied down the MRAPs. How far did it move? A couple inches? Yeah, they just moved a couple inches because it's nylon, you know? They have no idea how serious this really is. That cargo shifts during rotation, you'll wind up with a potential pitch problem. The discovery changes the face of the investigation. Did the MRAPs shift after takeoff? Get the nose down! I'm trying! Throwing the 747 dangerously out of balance. Searching for evidence that the cargo of National Airlines Flight 102 shifted on takeoff. Take a look at this. Investigators look more closely at the wreckage from the rear of the aircraft. Bam. What became obvious was that the tire from the aft Mat V had impacted the aft pressure bulkhead and left that tire impact. The metal antenna box from the rear of the same MRAP provides another big clue. Look at that. Paint transfer. Orange paint on the box comes from the flight recorders. That looks like a direct hit. The flight recorders are located at the rear of the plane. To hit them, the MRAP would have had to shift at least 12 feet. Where the CBR and FDR are located is 104 inches above the floor of the aircraft. That's exactly the same height as the metal antenna box from the rear of the MRAP. Now you're starting to see a chain of events that this vehicle had to be moving in an aftward direction. Could the shifting cargo bring down a huge 747? To find out, investigators take another look at the few pieces of salvaged wreckage they have, including the horizontal stabilizer from the rear of the plane. The horizontal stabilizer is a large control surface that adjusts the pitch of the plane during flight. It's controlled by a jack screw, which lowers and raises the edge of the stabilizer in response to the pilot's commands. What we were surprised to find out was that the jack screw had actually been pushed aft and had broken loose from the airplane. Without the jack screw, pilots would have had no control of the horizontal stabilizer and therefore no ability to balance the jet. Hmm. I wonder. The question now is, did the jack screw snap before or during the crash? Closer analysis reveals it snapped in the opposite direction than if it were broken in the crash. Just over here. Investigators wonder what could have caused the jack screw to snap off. They take some careful measurements and make a vital discovery. Straight hit. I was able to determine that the bumper of the Mat V lines up directly with the motor of the jack screw in the area where it detached from the lower fuselage. The results point to a clear suspect. Okay, let's play it. 
And based on this new evidence, investigators finally have a theory to prove. As the jet began its takeoff roll, the weight of the vehicle strains the nylon strap. An 18-ton MRAP comes loose and hurtles to the back of the plane. It smashes the rear jack screw, destroying the pilot's control of the horizontal stabilizer, making the plane impossible to fly. Back in Washington, D.C., the theory is examined using a detailed simulation. One MRAP at the back. See two elevators down. Equals one uncontrollable plane. Investigators finally know that an MRAP crashing into the jack screw crippled the plane. Keep on that. You take away the horizontal tail, you're not going to be able to control this airplane in pitch. This was an uncontrollable event. In the wake of the accident, the NTSB recommends mandatory certification of all cargo handling personnel, a move that would standardize their procedures, training, and workloads. The organization had looked at the capacity of the 747 and said, we can put five MRAPs in there. And without considering not only the weight, but how they were going to safely secure it. History shows that a plane that flies with a perilous payload flirts with catastrophe. But it's a flight risk that's entirely preventable. You can't take weight and balance for granted. Oh my god, we have an emergency on Air Midwest 5481. We are aiming for zero accidents. Humans can't do that, but humans with systems and backup systems can. That's what makes aviation safe when it's safe, and that's what screws it up when we don't do it the right way. <laughs> 